Chapter 2 of Concerning Virgins Book the Second This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Concerning Virgins by St. Ambrose Book the Second Chapter 2 the life of Mary is set before virgins as an example, and her many virtues are dwelt upon, her chastity, humility, hard life, love of retirement, and the like. Then her kindness to others, her zeal in learning, and love of frequenting the temple. St. Ambrose then sets forth how she, adorned with all these virtues, will come to meet the numberless bands of virgins and lead them with great triumph to the bridal chamber of the spouse. Let then the life of Mary be as it were virginity itself, set forth in a likeness, from which, as from a mirror, the appearance of chastity and the form of virtue is reflected. From this you may take your pattern of life, showing, as an example, the clear rules of virtue, what you have to correct, to effect, and to hold fast. The first thing which kindles ardor in learning is the greatness of the teacher. What is the teacher than the mother of God? What more glorious than she whom glory itself chose? What more chaste than she who bore a body without contact with another body? For why should I speak of her other virtues? She was a virgin not only in body but also in mind, who stained the sincerity of its disposition by no guile, who was humble in heart, grave in speech, prudent in mind, sparing of words, studious in reading, resting her hope not on uncertain riches, but on the prayer of the poor, intent on work, modest in discourse, wont to seek not man, but God as the judge of her thoughts, to injure no one, to have good will towards all, to rise up before her elders, not to envy her equals, to avoid boastfulness, to follow reason, to love virtue. When did she pain her parents even by look? When did she disagree with her neighbors? When did she despise the lowly? When did she avoid the needy? Being wont only to go to such gatherings of men as mercy would not blush at, nor modesty pass by. There was nothing gloomy in her eyes, nothing forward in her words, nothing unseemly in her acts. There was not a silly movement, nor unrestrained step, nor was her voice petulant, that the very appearance of her outward being might be the image of her soul, the representation of what is approved. For a well-ordered house ought to be recognized on the very threshold, and should show at the very first entrance that no darkness is hidden within, as our soul hindered by no restraints of the body may shine abroad like a lamp placed within. Why should I detail her spareness of food, her abundance of services, the one abounding beyond nature, the other almost insufficient for nature? And there were no seasons of slackness, but days of fasting, one upon the other. And if even the desire for refreshment came, her food was generally what came to hand, taken to keep off death, not to minister to comfort. Necessity before inclination caused her to sleep, and yet, when her body was sleeping, her soul was awake, and often in sleep either went again through what had been read, and went on with what had been interrupted by sleep, or carried out what had been designed, or foresaw what was to be carried out. She was unaccustomed to go from home, except for divine service and this with parents or kinsfolk. Busy in private at home, accompanied by others abroad, yet with no better guardian than herself, as she, inspiring respect by her gait and address, progressed not so much by the motion of her feet as by step upon step of virtue. But though the Virgin had other persons who were protectors of her body, she alone guarded her character. She can learn many points if she be her own teacher, who possesses the perfection of all virtues, for whatever she did is a lesson. Mary attended to everything 
as though she were warned by many, and fulfilled every obligation of virtue as though she were teaching rather than learning. Such has the evangelist shown her, such did the angel find her, such did the Holy Spirit choose her. Why delay about details? How her parents loved her, strangers praised her, how worthy she was that the Son of God should be born of her. She, when the angel entered, was found at home in privacy, without a companion, that no one might interrupt her attention or disturb her and she did not desire any women as companions who had the companionship of good thoughts. Moreover, she seemed to herself to be less alone when she was alone, for how should she be alone who had with her so many books, so many archangels, so many prophets? And so, too, when Gabriel visited her, did he find her? And Mary trembled, being disturbed, as though at the form of a man, but on hearing his name recognized him as one not unknown to her. And so she was a stranger as to men, but not as to the angel, that we might know that her ears were modest and her eyes bashful. Then when saluted she kept silence, and when addressed she answered. And she, whose feelings were first troubled, afterwards promised obedience. And Holy Scripture points out how modest she was toward her neighbors, for she became more humble when she knew herself to be chosen of God, and went forthwith to her kinswoman in the hill country, not in order to gain belief by anything external, for she had believed the word of God. Blessed, she said, art thou who didst believe. And she abode with her three months. Now, in such an interval of time, it is not that faith is being sought for, but kindness which is being shown. And this was after that the child, leaping in his mother's womb, had saluted the mother of the Lord, attaining to reason before birth. And then, in the many subsequent wonders, when the barren bore a son, the virgin conceived, the dumb spake, the wise men worshipped, Simeon waited, the stars gave notice. Mary, who was moved by the angel's entrance, was unmoved by the miracles. Mary! it is said, kept all these things in her heart. Though she was the mother of the Lord, yet she desired to learn the precepts of the Lord, and she who brought forth God, yet desired to know God. And then, how she also went every year to Jerusalem at the solemn day of the Passover, and went with Joseph. Everywhere is modesty the companion of her singular virtues in the Virgin. This without which virginity cannot exist, must be the inseparable companion of virginity. And so Mary did not go even to the temple without the guardianship of her modesty. This is the likeness of virginity. For Mary was such that her example alone is a lesson for all. If, then, the author displeases us not, let us make trial of the production, that whoever desires its reward for herself may imitate the pattern. How many kinds of virtues shine forth in one virgin? The secret of modesty, the banner of faith, the service of devotion, the virgin within the house, the companion for the ministry, the mother at the temple. Oh, how many virgins shall she meet? How many shall she embrace and bring to the Lord and say, She has been faithful to her espousal, to my son. She has kept her bridal couch with spotless modesty. How shall the Lord himself commend them to his Father, repeating again those words of his, Holy Father, these are they whom I have kept for thee, on whom the Son of Man lent his head and dressed it. I ask that where I am, there they may be with me. And if they ought to benefit not themselves only, who lived not for themselves alone, one virgin may redeem her parents, another her brothers. Holy Father, the world hath not known me, but these have known me, and have willed not to know the world. What a procession shall that be, what joy of applauding angels, when she is found worthy of dwelling in heaven, who lived on earth a heavenly life. Then too Mary, taking her timbrel, shall stir up the choirs of virgins, 
singing to the Lord, because they have passed through the sea of this world without suffering from the waves of this world. Then each shall rejoice, saying, I will go to the altar of God, to God who maketh my youth glad, and I will offer unto God thanksgiving, and pay my vows unto the Most High. Nor would I hesitate to admit you to the altars of God, whose souls I would without hesitation call altars, on which Christ is daily offered for the redemption of the body. For if the virgin's body be a temple of God, what is her soul, which, the ashes, as it were, of the body being shaken off, once more uncovered by the hand of the eternal priest, exhales the vapor of the divine fire? Blessed virgins, who emit a fragrance through divine grace as gardens do through flowers, temples through religion, altars through the priest. End of chapter 2 Book the Second Virgins Book the Second This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Concerning Virgins by St. Ambrose Book the Second Chapter 3 St. Ambrose, having set forth the Virgin Mary as a pattern for life, adduces Thecla as a model for learning how to die. Thecla suffered not from the beasts to whom she was condemned, but on the contrary, received from them signs of reverence. He then proceeds to introduce a more recent example. Let then Holy Mary instruct you in the discipline of life, and Thecla teach you how to be offered, for she avoiding nuptial intercourse, and condemned through her husband's rage, changed even the disposition of wild beasts by their reverence for virginity. For being made ready for the wild beast, when avoiding the gaze of men, she offered her vital parts to a fierce lion, caused those who had turned away their immodest looks to turn them back modestly. The beast was to be seen lying on the ground, licking her feet, showing without a sound that it could not injure the sacred body of the virgin. So the beast reverenced his prey, and forgetful of his own nature, put on that nature which men had lost. One could see, as it were, by some transfusion of nature, men clothed with savageness, goading the beast to cruelty, and the beast kissing the feet of the virgin, teaching them what was due from men. Virginity has in itself so much that is admirable, that even lions admire it. Food did not induce them, though kept without their meal. No impulse hurried them on when excited. Anger did not exasperate them when stirred up, nor did their habits lead them blindly as they were wont, nor their own natural disposition possess them with fierceness. They set an example of piety when reverencing the martyr, and gave a lesson in favor of chastity when they did nothing but kiss the virgin's feet, with their eyes turned to the ground, as though through modesty, fearing that any male, even a beast, should see the virgin naked. Someone will say, Why have you brought forward the example of Mary, and if anyone could be found to imitate the Lord's mother? And why that of Thecla, whom the apostle of the Gentiles trained. Give us a teacher of our own sort, if you wish for disciples. I will therefore set before you a recent example of this sort, that you may understand that the apostle is the teacher, not of one only, but of all. End of chapter 3, book the second. Concerning Virgins. Book the Second. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Concerning Virgins. By St. Ambrose. Book the Second. Chapter 4. A virgin at Antioch, having refused to sacrifice to idols, was condemned to a house of ill-fame. 
whence she escaped unharmed, having changed clothes with a Christian soldier. Then, when he was condemned for this, she returned, and the two contended for the prize of martyrdom, which was at last given to each. There was lately at Antioch a virgin, who avoided being seen in public, but the more she shrank from men's eyes, the more they longed for her. For beauty, which is heard of but not seen, is more desired, there being two incentives to passion, love and knowledge, so long as nothing is met with which pleases less. And that which pleases is thought to be of more worth, because the eye is not in this case the judge by investigation, but the mind inflamed with love is full of longing. And so, the Holy Virgin, lest their passions should be longer fed by the desire of gaining her, professed her intention of preserving her chastity, and so quenched the fires of those wicked men, that she was no longer loved, but informed against. So a persecution arose. The maiden, not knowing how to escape, and afraid lest she might fall into the hands of those who were plotting against her chastity, prepared her soul for heroic virtue, being so religious as not to fear death, so chaste as to expect it. The day of her crown arrived. The expectation of all was at its height. The maiden is brought forward and makes her twofold profession of religion and of chastity. But when they saw the constancy of her profession, her fear for her modesty, her readiness for tortures, and her blushes at being looked on, they began to consider how they might overcome her religion by setting chastity before her, so that, having deprived her of that which was the greatest, they might also deprive her of that which they had left. So the sentence was that she should either sacrifice or be sent to a house of ill fame. After what manner do they worship their gods who thus avenge them? Or how do they live themselves, who give sentence after this fashion? And the virgin, not hesitating about her religion, but fearful as to her chastity, began to reflect, What am I to do? Each crown, that of martyrdom and that of virginity, is grudged me today. But the name of virgin is not acknowledged where the author of virginity is denied. How can one be a virgin who cherishes a harlot? How can one be a virgin who loves adulterers? How a virgin, if she seeks for a lover? It is preferable to have a virgin mind than a virgin body. Each is good, if each can be possible. If it be not possible, let me be chaste, not to man, but to God. Rahab, too, was a harlot, but after she believed in God, she found salvation and Judith adorned herself that she might please an adulterer, but because she did this for religion and not for love, no one considered her an adulteress. This instance turned out well, for if she, who entrusted herself to religion, both preserved her chastity and her country, perhaps I, by preserving my religion, shall also preserve my chastity. But if Judith had preferred her chastity to her religion, when her country had been lost, she would also have lost her chastity. And so, instructed by such examples, and at the same time bearing in mind the words of the Lord, where he says, Whosoever shall lose his life for my sake shall find it, she wept and was silent, that the adulterer might not even hear her speaking, and she did not choose the wrong done to her modesty, but rejected wrong done to Christ. Consider whether it was possible for her to suffer her body to be enchased, who guarded even her speech. For some time my words have been becoming bashful, and fear to laud on or describe the wicked series of what was done. Close your eyes, ye virgins. The virgin of God is taken to a house of shame. But now unclose your ears, ye virgins. The Virgin of Christ can be exposed to shame, but cannot be contaminated. Everywhere she is the Virgin of God, and the Temple of God, and houses of ill fame cannot injure chastity, but chastity does away with the ill fame of the place. 
a great rush of wanton men is made to the place. Listen, ye holy virgins, to the miracles of the martyr. Forget the name of the place. The door is shut within. The hawks cry without. Some are contending who shall first attack the prey. But she, with her hands raised to heaven, as though she had come to a house of prayer, not to a resort of lust, says, O Christ, who didst tame the fierce lions for the virgin Daniel, thou canst also tame the fierce minds of men. Fire became as dew to the Hebrew children, the water stood up for the Jews, of thy mercy, not of its own nature. Susanna knelt down for punishment, and triumphed over her adulterous accusers, the right hand withered which violated the gifts of thy temple. And now thy temple itself is violated. Suffer not sacrilegious incest, thou who didst not suffer theft. Let thy name be now again glorified in that I who came here for shame may go away a virgin. Scarcely had she finished her prayer, when, lo, a man with the aspect of a terrible warrior burst in. How the virgin trembled before him to whom the trembling people gave way. But she did not forget what she had read. Daniel, said she, had gone to see the punishment of Susanna, and alone pronounced her guiltless, whom the people had condemned. A sheep may be hidden in the shape of this wolf. Christ has his soldiers also, who is master of legions. Or, perchance, an executioner has come in. Fear not, my soul, such an one makes martyrs. O virgin, thy faith has saved thee. And the soldier said to her, Fear not, sister, I pray you. I, a brother, am come hither to save life, not to destroy it. Save me, that you yourself may be saved. I came in like an adulterer, to go forth, if you will, as a martyr. Let us change our attire. Mine will fit you, and yours will fit me, and each for Christ. Your robe will make me a true soldier, mine will make you a virgin. You will be clothed well. I shall be unclothed even better than the persecutor may recognize me. Take the garment which will conceal the woman. Give me that which shall consecrate me a martyr. Put on the cloak which will hide the limbs of a virgin, but preserve her modesty. Take the cap which will cover your hair and conceal your countenance. They who have entered houses of ill fame are wont to blush. When you have gone forth, take care not to look back, remembering Lot's wife, who lost her very nature because she looked back at what was unchaste, though with chaste eyes. And be not afraid lest any part of the sacrifice fail. I will offer the victim to God for you. Do you offer the soldier to Christ for me? You have served the good service of chastity, the wages of which are everlasting life. You have the breastplate of righteousness, which protects the body with spiritual armor, the shield of faith, with which to ward off wounds, and the helmet of salvation, for there is the defense of our salvation where Christ is, since the man is the head of the woman, and Christ of the virgin. Whilst saying this, he put off his cloak. This garment has been up to this time suspected of being that of a persecutor and adulterer. The virgin offered her neck, the soldier his cloak. What a spectacle that was, what a manifestation of grace, when they were contending for martyrdom in a house of ill fame. Let the characters be also considered, a soldier and a virgin, that is, persons unlike in natural disposition, but alike by the mercy of God, that the saying might be fulfilled. Then the wolves and the lambs shall feed together. Behold the lamb and the wolf not only feed together, but are also offered together. Why should I say more? Having changed her garment, the maiden flies from the snare, not now with wings of her own, seeing she was born on spiritual wings, and, a sight which the ages had never seen, she leaves the house of ill fame a virgin, but a virgin of Christ. But they who were looking with their eyes yet saw not, raged like robbers for prey, or wolves for a lamb, one who was more shameless went in. But when he took in the state of the matter with his eyes, he said, 
What is this? A maiden entered. Now a man is to be seen here. This is not the old fable of a hind instead of a maiden, but in truth a virgin become a soldier. I had heard, but believed not, that Christ changed water into wine. Now he has begun also to change the sexes. Let us depart hence, whilst we still are what we were. Am I too changed who see things differently from what I believe them to be? I came to a house of ill fame, and see a surety, and yet I go forth changed. For I shall go out chaste, who came in unchaste. When the affair was known, because a crown was due to such a conqueror, he was condemned for the virgin who was seized for the virgin, and so not only a virgin but a martyr came forth from the house of ill fame. It is reported that the maiden ran to the place of punishment, and that they both contended for death. He said, "I am condemned to death. The sentence let you go free when it retained me." And she replied, "I did not choose you as my surety on pain of death, but as a guarantee for my chastity. If chastity be attacked, my sex remains. If blood is sought, I desire none to give bail for me. I have the means to pay. The sentence was pronounced on me, which was pronounced for me. Undoubtedly, if I had offered you a security for my debt, and in my absence the judge had assigned your property to the creditor." You would share the sentence with me, and I should pay your obligations with my patrimony. Were I to refuse, who would not judge me worthy of a shameful death? How much more am I bound to where there is a question of death? Let me die innocent, that I may not die guilty. In this matter there is no middle course. Today I shall either be guilty of your blood or a martyr in my own. If I came back quickly, who dares to shut me out? If I delayed, who dares acquit me? I owe a greater debt to the laws, who am guilty not only for my own flight, but also of the death of another. My limbs are equal to death, which were not equal to dishonor. A virgin can accept a wound, who could not accept contumely. I avoided disgrace, not martyrdom. I gave up my robe to you. I did not alter my profession, and if you deprive me of death. You will not have rescued, but circumvented me. Beware, pray, of resisting. Beware of venturing to contend with me. Take not away the kindness you have conferred on me. In denying me the execution of this sentence, you are setting up again the former one, for the sentence is changed for a former one. If the latter binds me not, the former one does. We can each satisfy the sentence if you suffer me to be slain first, from you. They can exact no other penalty, but her chastity is in danger with a virgin, and so you will be more glorious if you are seen to have made a martyr of an adulteress, than to have made again an adulteress of a martyr. What do you think was the end? The two contended, and both gained the victory, and the crown was not divided, but became two. So the holy martyrs, conferring benefits one on the other. Gave the one the impulse and the other the result to their martyrdom. End of chapter four, book the second. Of concerning virgins, book the second. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer. Please visit LibriVox.org. Concerning virgins by Saint Ambrose, Book the Second, Chapter Five. The story of the two Pythagorean friends, Damon and Pythias, is related by Saint Ambrose, who points out that the case mentioned in the last chapter is more praiseworthy. A comparison is instituted between the treatment of their gods by heathen. Without any punishment, and Jeroboam's irreverence with its punishment, and the schools of the philosophers Lord Damon and Pythias, the Pythagoreans, to the skies, of whom one, when condemned to death, asked for time to set his affairs in order, whereupon the tyrant, in his cunning, not supposing that such could be found, asked for a bondsman who should suffer the penalty if the other delayed his return. 
I do not know which act of the two was the more noble. The one found the bondsman, the other offered himself. And so, while he who was condemned met with some delay, the bondsman with calm countenance did not refuse death. As he was being led forth, his friend returned, and offered his neck to the axe. Then the tyrant, wondering that friendship was dearer to philosophers than life, asked himself to be received into friendship by those whom he had condemned. The grace of virtue was so great that it moved even a tyrant. These things are worthy of praise, but are inferior to our instance. For those two were men. With us one was a virgin, who had first to be superior to her sex. Those were friends. These were unknown to each other. Those offered themselves to one tyrant, these to many tyrants. And these more cruel, for in the former case the tyrant spared them, these slew them. With the former one was bound by necessity, with these the will of each was free. In this too the latter were the wiser, that with those the end of their zeal was the pleasure of friendship. With these the crown of martyrdom, for they strove for men, these for God. And since we have mentioned that man who was condemned, it is fitting to add what he thought of his gods, that you may judge how weak they are whom their own followers deride. For he, having come into the temple of Jupiter, bade them take off the fillet of gold with which his image was crowned, and to put on one of wool instead, saying that the golden fillet was cold in winter and heavy in summer. So he derided his god as being unable to bear either a weight or cold. He too, when he saw the golden beard of Esculapius, bade them remove it, saying that it was not fit for the son to have a beard when the father had none. Again, he took away the golden bowls from the images which held them, saying that he ought to receive what the gods gave. For, said he, men make prayers to receive good things from the gods, and nothing is better than gold. If, however, gold be evil, the gods ought not to have it. If it be good, it is better that men should have it who know how to use it. Such objects of ridicule were they, that neither could Jupiter defend his garment, nor Aesculapius his beard, for Apollo had not yet begun to grow one, nor could all those who are esteemed gods keep the golden bowls which they were holding, not fearing the charge of theft, so much as not having any feeling. Who then would worship them, who can neither defend themselves as gods, nor hide themselves as men? But when in the temple of our God, that wicked king Jeroboam took away the gifts which his father had laid up and offered to idols upon the holy altar, did not his right hand, which he stretched out wither, and his idols, which he called upon, were not able to help him. Then turning to the Lord, he asked for pardon, and at once his hand, which had withered by sacrilege, was healed by true religion. So complete an example was there set forth in one person, both of divine mercy and wrath, when he who was sacrificing suddenly lost his right hand, but when penitent received forgiveness. End of chapter 5, book the second. Learning Virgins, book the second. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Concerning Virgins by St. Ambrose, Book the Second, Chapter Six. St. Ambrose, in concluding the second book, ascribes any good there may be in it to the merits of the virgins, and sets forth that it was right before laying down any severe precepts to encourage them by examples, as is done both in human teaching and in Holy Scripture. I, who have been not yet three years a bishop, have prepared this offering for you, holy virgins, although untaught by my own experience, yet having learned much from your mode of life. For what experience could have grown up in so short a time of being initiated in religion? If you find any flowers herein, 
gather them together in the bosom of your lives. These are not precepts for virgins, but instances taken from virgins. My words have sketched the likeness of your virtue. You may see the reflection of your gravity, as it were, in the mirror of this discourse. If you have received any pleasure from my ability, all the fragrance of this book is yours. And since there are as many opinions as there are persons, if there be anything simple in my treatise, let all read it. If anything stronger, let the more mature prove it. If anything modest, let it cleave to the breast and tinge the cheeks. If there be anything flowery, let the flowery age of youth not disdain it. We ought to stir up the love of the bride, for it is written, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God. At bridal feasts we ought to adorn the hair at least with some ornaments of prayer, for it is written, Smite the hands together, and strike with the foot. We ought to scatter roses on those uninterrupted bridals. Even in these temporal marriages the bride is received with acclamation before she receives commands, lest hard commands should hurt her, before love cherished by kindness grows strong. Horses learn to love the sound of patting their necks, that they may not refuse the yoke, and are first trained with words of enticement before the stripe of discipline. But when the horse has submitted its neck to the yoke, the rein pulls in, and the spur urges on, and its companions draw it, and the driver bids it. So too our virgin ought first to play with pious love, and admire the golden supports of the heavenly marriage couch on the very threshold of marriage, and to see the doorposts adorned with wreaths of leaves, and to taste the delight of the musicians playing within, that she may not through fear withdraw herself from the Lord's yoke, before she obeys his call. Come then hither from Lebanon, my spouse, come hither from Lebanon, thou shalt pass and pass through. This verse must be often repeated by us, that at least being called by the words of the Lord, she may follow if there be any who will not trust the words of man. We have not formed this power for ourselves, but have received it. This is the heavenly teaching of the mystic song, let him kiss me with the kisses of his mouth, for thy breasts are better than wine, and the odour of thy ointments is above all spices. Thy name is as ointment poured forth. The whole of that place of delights, sounds of sport, stirs up approval, calls forth love. Therefore, it continues, have the maidens loved thee, and have drawn thee, let us run after the odour of thy ointments. The king hath brought me into his chamber. She began with kisses, and so attained to the chamber. She, now so patient of hard toil, and of practised virtue, as to open the bars with her hand, go forth into the field, and abide in strongholds, at the beginning ran after the odour of the ointment. Soon, when she is come into the chamber, the ointment is changed, and see whither she goes. If it be a wall, it is said, we will build upon it towers of silver. She, who sported with kisses, now builds towers that, encircled with the precious battlements of the saints, she may not only render fruitless the attacks of the enemy, but also erect the safe defences of holy merits. End of chapter 6 End of book the second of Concerning Virgins by St. Ambrose of Milan Of Concerning Virgins, Book the Third. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Concerning Virgins, by St. Ambrose of Milan. Book the Third, Chapter One. St. Ambrose now goes back to the address of Liberius, when he gave the veil to Marcelina. Touching on the crowds pressing to the bridal feast of that spouse who feeds them all, he passes on to the fitness of her profession on the day on which Christ was born of a virgin, and concludes with a fervent exhortation to love him. 
inasmuch as I have digressed in what I have said in the two former books. It is now time, holy sister, to reconsider those precepts of Liberius of blessed memory, which he used to talk over with me. As the holier the man, the more pleasing is his discourse. For he, when on the nativity of the Saviour, in the church of St. Peter you signified your profession of virginity by your change of attire, and what today could be better than that on which the virgin received her child, whilst many virgins were standing round and vying with each other for your companionship. You, said he, my daughter, have desired a good espousal. You see how great a crowd has come together for the birthday of your spouse, and none has gone away without food. This is he, who, when invited to the marriage feast, changed water into wine. He, too, will confer the pure sacrament of virginity on you, who before were subject to the vile elements of material nature. This is he, who fed four thousand in the wilderness with five loaves and two fishes. He could have fed more. If more had been there, to be fed, they would have been. And now he has called many to your espousal, but it is not now barley bread, but the body from heaven which is supplied. Today, indeed, he was born after the manner of men, of a virgin, but was begotten of the Father before all things, resembling his mother in body, his father in power. Only begotten on earth, and only begotten in heaven. God of God, born of a virgin, righteousness from the Father, power from the Mighty One, light of light, not unequal to his Father, nor separated in power, not confused by extension of the word, or enlargement as though mingled with the Father, but distinguished from the Father by virtue of his generation. He is your brother, without whom neither things in heaven, nor things in the sea, nor things on earth consist. The good word of the Father, which was, it is said, in the beginning, here you have his eternity, and, it is said, the word was with God, here you have his power, undivided and inseparable from the Father, and the word was God, here you have his unbegotten Godhead, for your faith is to be drawn from the mutual relationship. Love him, my daughter, for he is good for none is good save God only. For if there be no doubt that the Son is God, and that God is good, there is certainly no doubt that God the Son is good. Love him, I say. He it is whom the Father begat before the morning star, as being eternal. He brought him forth from the womb as the Son. He uttered him from his heart as the Word. He it is in whom the Father is well pleased, he is the arm of the Father, for he is creator of all, and the wisdom of the Father, for he proceeded from the mouth of God, the power of the Father, because the fullness of the Godhead dwelleth in him bodily, and the Father so loved him as to bear him in his bosom and place him at his right hand, that you may learn his wisdom and know his power. If then Christ is the power of God, was God ever without power? Was the Father ever without the Son? If the Father of a certainty always was, of a certainty the Son always was, so he is the perfect Son of a perfect Father. For he who derogates from the power, derogates from him whose is the power. The perfection of the Godhead does not admit of inequality. Love then him whom the Father loves. Honor him whom the Father honors. For he that honoureth not the Son, honoureth not the Father. And whoso denieth the Son, hath not the Father. So much as to the faith. End of chapter 1 of Book the Third Of Concerning Virgins, Book the Third This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Concerning Virgins by St. Ambrose Book the Third, Chapter Two Touching next upon the training of a virgin, 
he speaks of moderation in food and drink, and of restraint upon the impulses of the mind, introducing some teaching upon the fable of the death and resurrection of Hippolytus, and advises the avoidance of certain meats. But sometimes, even when faith is to be relied upon, youth is not trusted. Use wine, therefore, sparingly, in order that the weakness of the body may not increase, not for pleasurable excitement, for each alike kindles a flame, both wine and youth. Let fasts also put a bridle on tender age, and spare diet restrain the unsubdued appetites with a kind of rain. Let reason check, hope subdue, and fear curb them. For he who knows not how to govern his desires, like a man, run away with by wild horses, is overthrown, bruised, torn, and injured. And this is said to have happened to a youth for his love of Diana. But the fable is coloured with poet's tales, that Neptune, stirred with grief at his rival being preferred, sent madness upon his horses, whereby his great power might be set forth in that he overcame the youth, not by strength, but by fraud. And from this event a yearly sacrifice is celebrated for Diana, when a horse is offered at her altar. And they say that she was a virgin, and, of which even harlots would be ashamed, yet could love one who did not love her. But as far as I am concerned, let their fables have authority. For though each be criminal, it is yet a less evil that a youth should have been so enamoured of an adulteress as to perish, than that two gods should, as they relate, contend for committing adultery, and that Jupiter avenged the grief of his daughter who played the harlot on the physician who cured the wound of him, who had violated Diana in the woods. A most excellent huntress, no doubt, not of wild beasts, but of lust, yet also of wild beasts, so that she was worshipped naked. Let them ascribe then to Neptune the mastery over madness, in order to fix on him the crime of unchaste love. Let them ascribe to Diana the rule over the woods, wherein she dwelt, so as to establish the adultery which she practised. Let them ascribe to Esculapius the restoration of the dead, so long as they confess that when struck by lightning he himself escaped not. Let them also ascribe to Jupiter the thunderbolts which he did not possess, so that they witnessed to the disgrace with which he was laden. And I think that one should sparingly eat all kinds of food which cause heat to the limbs, for flesh drags down even eagles as they fly. But within you let that bird of which we read, Thy youth shall be renewed like the eagles, holding its cause on high, swift in its virgin flight, be ignorant of the desire for unnecessary food. The gathering of banquets and salutations must be avoided. End of chapter 2 Book the Third Concerning Virgins, Book the Third This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Concerning Virgins, by St. Ambrose, Book the Third, Chapter 3 Virgins are exhorted to avoid visits, to observe modesty, to be silent during the celebration of the mysteries, after the example of Mary. Then after narrating the story of a heathen youth, and saying of a poet, St. Ambrose relates a miracle wrought by a holy priest. I will, too, that visits amongst the younger, except such as may be due to parents and those of like age, be few. For modesty is worn away by intercourse, and boldness breaks forth, laughter creeps in, and bashfulness is lessened, whilst politeness is studied. Not to answer one who asks a question is childishness, to answer is nonsense. I should prefer, therefore, that conversation should rather be wanting to a virgin than abound. For if women are bidden to keep silence in churches, even about divine things, and to ask their husbands at home, what do we think should be the caution of virgins, 
in whom modesty adorns their age, and silence commends their modesty. Was it a small sign of modesty that when Rebecca came to wed Isaac, and saw her bridegroom, she took a veil, that she might not be seen before they were united? Certainly the fair virgin feared not for her beauty, but for her modesty. What of Rachel? How she, when Jacob's kiss had been taken, wept and groaned, and would not have ceased weeping, had she not known him to be a kinsman? So she both observed what was due to modesty, and omitted not kindly affection. But if it is said to a man, Gaze not on a maid, lest she cause thee to fall, what is to be said to a consecrated virgin who, if she loves, sins in mind, if she is loved, in act also? The virtue of silence, especially in church, is very great. Let no sentence of the divine lessons escape you. If you give ear, restrain your voice, utter no word with your lips which you would wish to recall, but let your boldness to speak be sparing. For in truth, in much speaking, there is abundance of sin. To the murderer it was said, Thou hast sinned, be silent, that he might not sin more. But to the virgin it must be said, Be silent, lest thou sin. For Mary, as we read, kept in heart all things that were said concerning her son. And do you, when any passage is read where Christ is announced as about to come, or is shown to have come, not make a noise by talking, but attend. Is anything more unbecoming than the divine words should be so drowned by talking, as not to be heard, believed, or made known, that the sacraments should be indistinctly heard through the sound of voices, that prayer should be hindered when offered for the salvation of all? The Gentiles pay respect to their idols by silence, of which this instance is given. As Alexander, the king of the Macedonians, was sacrificing, the sleeve of a barbarian lad, who was lighting the lamp for him, caught fire and burned his body, yet he remained without moving, and neither betrayed the pain by a groan, nor showed his suffering by silent tears. Such was the discipline of reverence in a barbarian lad, that nature was subdued. Yet he feared not the gods, who were no gods, but the king. For why should he fear those who, if the same fire had caught them, would have burned? How much better still is it, where a youth at his father's banquet is bidden not to betray by coarse gestures his unchaste loves? And do you, holy virgin, abstain from groans, cries, coughing, and laughter at the mystery? Can you not at the mystery do what he did at a banquet? Let virginity be first marked by the voice. Let modesty close the mouth. Let religion remove weakness, and habit instruct nature. Let her gravity first announce a virgin to me, a modest approach, a sober gait, a bashful countenance, and let the march of virtue be preceded by the evidence of integrity. That virgin is not sufficiently worthy of approval, who has to be inquired about when she is seen. There is common story now, when the excessive croaking of frogs was resounding in the ears of the faithful people, the priest of God bade them to be silent and show reverence to the sacred words, and then at once the noise was stilled. Shall then the marshes keep silence and not the frogs? And shall irrational animals re-acknowledge by reverence what they know not by nature? While the shamelessness of men is such that many care not to pay that respect to the religious feelings of their minds, which they do to the pleasure of their ears. End of chapter 3, book the third. Concerning virgins, book the third. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Concerning Virgins by St. Ambrose Book the Third, Chapter Four Having summed up the address of Liberius, St. Ambrose passes on to the virtues of his sister, especially her fasts, which, however, he advises her to moderate to some extent, 
and to exercise herself in other matters, after the example which he adduces. Especially he recommends the Lord's Prayer, and the repetition of psalms by night, and the recitation of the Creed before daylight. After such a fashion did Liberius of holy memory address you, in words beyond the reality of practice in most cases, but coming short of your performance, who have not only attained to the whole of discipline by your virtue, but have surpassed it in your zeal. For we are bidden to practice fasting, but only for single days. But you, multiplying nights and days, pass untold periods without food, and if ever requested to partake of some, and to lay aside your book a little while, you at once answer, Man does not live by bread alone, but by every word of God. Your very meals consisted but of what food came to hand, so that fasting is to be preferred to eating what was repugnant. Your drink is from the spring, your weeping and prayer combine, your sleep is on your book. These kings were suited to younger years, whilst he was ripening with the grey hairs of age. But when a virgin has gained the triumph over her subdued body, she should lessen her toil, that she may be preserved as teacher for a younger age. The vine laden with the fruitful branches of full growth soon breaks, unless it be from time to time kept back. But whilst it is young, let it grow rank, and as it grows older be pruned, so as not to grow into a forest of twigs, or die deprived of life by its acceptive produce. A good husbandman, by tending the soil, keeps the vine in excellent order, protects it from cold, and guards it from being parched by the midday sun. And he works his land by turns, or if he will not let it lie fallow, he alternates his crops, so that the fields may rest through change of produce. Do you too, a veteran in virginity, at least sow the fields of your breast with different seeds, at one time with moderate sustenance, at another with sparing fasts, with reading, work, and prayer, that change of toil may be as a truce for rest. The whole land does not produce the same harvest. On one side vines grow on the hills, on another you can see the purple olives, elsewhere the scented roses. And after leaving the plough, the strong husbandman with his fingers scrapes the soil to plant the roots of flowers, and with the rough hands wherewith he turns the bullocks striving amongst the vines, he gently presses the udders of the sheep. The land is the better, the more numerous are its fruits. So do you, following the example of a good husbandman, avoid cleaving your soil with perpetual fastings as if with deep ploughings. Let the rose of modesty bloom in your garden, and the lily of the mind, and let the violet beds drink from the source of sacred blood. There is a common saying, what you wish to perform abundantly, sometimes do not do at all. There ought to be something to add to the days of Lent, but so that nothing be done for the sake of ostentation, but of religion. Frequent prayer also commends us to God, for if the prophet says, Seven times a day have I praised thee, though he was busy with the affairs of a kingdom, what ought we to do who read? Watch and pray that ye enter not into temptation. Certainly our customary prayers ought to be said with giving of thanks, when we rise from sleep, when we go forth, when we prepare to receive food, after receiving it, and at the hour of incense, when at last we are going to rest. And again, in your bedchamber itself, I would have you join psalms in frequent interchange with the Lord's Prayer, either when you wake up, or before sleep bedews your body, so that at the very commencement of rest, Sleep may find you free from the care of worldly matters, meditating upon the things of God. And indeed, he who first found out the name of philosophy itself, every day before he went to rest, had the flute player play softer melodies to soothe his mind disturbed by worldly cares. But he, like a man washing tiles, fruitlessly desired to drive away worldly things by worldly means. For he was indeed rather besmearing himself with fresh mud in seeking a reward from pleasure. But let us, having wiped off the filth of earthly vices, 
purify our utmost souls from every defilement of the flesh. We ought also specially to repeat the creed as a seal upon our hearts daily before light and to recur to it in thought whenever we are in fear of anything. For when is the soldier in his tent or the warrior in battle without his military oath? End of chapter 4 Book the Third Of Concerning Virgins Book the Third This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Concerning Virgins by St. Ambrose Book the Third, Chapter 5 St. Ambrose, speaking of tears, explains David's saying, Every night wash I my couch with my tears, and goes on to speak of Christ bearing our griefs and infirmities. Everything should be referred to his honor, and we ought to rejoice with spiritual joy, but not after a worldly fashion. And who can now fail to understand that the holy prophet said for our instruction, Every night will I wash my couch and water my bed with my tears? For if you take it literally for his bed, he shows that such abundance of tears should be shed as to wash the bed and water it with tears, the couch of him who is praying, for weeping has to be done with the present, rewards with the future, since it is said, Blessed are ye that weep, for ye shall laugh. Or if we take the word of the prophet as applied to our bodies, we must wash away the offences of the body with tears of penitence. For Solomon made himself a bed of wood from Lebanon, its pillars were of silver, its bottom of gold, its back strewn with gems. What is that bed but the fashion of our body? For by gem is set forth the splendor of the brightness of the air, fire is set forth by the gold, water by silver, and earth by wood, of which four elements the human body consists, in which our soul rests. If it do not exist deprived of rest by the roughness of hills, or the damp ground, but raised on high, above vices, supported by the wood. For which reason David also says, The Lord will send him help upon his bed of pain. For how can that be a bed of pain, which cannot feel pain, and which has no feeling? But the body of pain is like the body of that death, of which it is said, O wretched man that I am, who shall deliver me from the body of this death? And since I have inserted a clause in which mention is made of the Lord's body, lest any one should be troubled at reading that the Lord took a body of pain, let him remember that the Lord grieved and wept over the death of Lazarus, and was wounded in his passion, and that from the wound there went forth blood and water, and that he gave up his spirit, water for washing, blood for drink, the spirit for his rising again. For Christ alone is to us hope, faith, and love, hope in his resurrection, faith in the lover, and love in the sacrament. And as he took a body of pain, so too he turned his bed in his weakness, for he converted it to the benefit of human flesh. For by his passion weakness was ended, and death by his resurrection. And yet you ought to mourn for the world, but to rejoice in the Lord, to be sad for penitence, but joyful for grace. Though, too, the teacher of the Gentiles by a wholesome precept has bidden to weep with them that weep, and to rejoice with them that do rejoice. But let him who desires to solve the whole difficulty of this question have recourse to the same apostle. Whatsoever ye do, says he, in word or deed, do all in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, giving thanks to God the Father by him. Let us then refer all our words and deeds to Christ, who brought life out of death, and created light out of darkness. For as a sick body is at one time cherished by warmth, at another soothed by cool applications, and the variation of remedies, if carried out according to the direction of the physician, is healthful, but if done in opposition to his orders, increases the sickness. So whatever is paid to Christ is a remedy, whatever is done by our own will is harmful. 
There ought then to be the joy of the mind, conscious of right, not excited by unrestrained feasts, or nuptial concerts, for in such modesty is not safe, and temptation may be suspected, where excessive dancing accompanies festivities. I desire that the virgins of God should be far from this, for as a certain teacher of this world has said, no one dances when sober unless he is mad. Now, if according to the wisdom of this world, either drunkenness or madness is the cause of dancing, what a warning is given to us amongst the instances mentioned in the divine scriptures, where John, the forerunner of Christ, being beheaded at the wish of a dancer, is an instance that the allurements of dancing did more harm than the madness of sacrilegious anger. End of chapter 5 Book the Third Concerning Virgins Book the Third This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Concerning Virgins by St. Ambrose Book the Third, Chapter Six Having mentioned the Baptist, St. Ambrose enters into a description of the events concerning his death, and speaks against dancing and the festivities of the wicked. And since we must not cursorily pass by the mention of so great a man, let us consider who he was, by whom, on what account, how, and at what time he was slain. A just man, he is put to death by adulterers, and the penalty of a capital crime is turned off by the guilty on to the judge. Again the reward of the dancer is the death of the prophet. Lastly, a matter of honor even to all barbarians, the cruel sentence is given in the midst of banqueting and festivities, and the news of the deadly crime is carried from the banquet to the prison, and then from the prison to the banquet. How many crimes are there in one wicked act? A banquet of death is set out with royal luxury, and when a larger concourse than usual had come together, the daughter of the queen, sent for from within the private apartments, is brought forth to dance in the sight of men, what could she have learned from an adulteress but loss of modesty? Is anything so conductive to lust as with unseemly movements thus to expose in nakedness those parts of the body which either nature has hidden or custom has veiled? To sport with the looks, to turn the neck, to loosen the hair? Fitly was the next step an offence against God. For what modesty can there be where there is dancing and noise and clapping of hands? Then, it is said, the king, being pleased, said unto the damsel, that she should ask of the king whatsoever she would. Then he swore, that if she asked he would give her even half of his kingdom. See, how worldly men themselves judge of their worldly power, so as to give even kingdoms for dancing. But the damsel, being taught by her mother, demanded that the head of John should be brought to her on a dish. That which is said that the king was sorry, is not repentance on the part of the king, but a confession of guilt, which is, according to the wont of the divine rule, that they who have done evil condemn themselves by their own confession. But for their sakes, which sat with him, it is said, what is more base than that a murder should be committed in order not to displease those who sat at meat? And, it follows, for his oath's sake, what a new religion! He had better have forsworn himself. The Lord, therefore, in the gospel bids us not to swear at all, that there be no cause for perjury, and no need of offending. And so an innocent man is slain, that an oath be not violated. I know which to have in the greatest horror. Perjury is more endurable than are the oaths of tyrants. Who would not think when he saw someone running from the banquet to the prison, that orders had been given to set the prophet free, who, I say, having heard that it was Herod's birthday, and of the state banquet, and the choice given to the damsel of choosing whatever she wished, 
would not think that the man was sent to set John free. What has cruelty in common with delicacies? What have death and pleasure in common? The prophet is hurried to suffer at the festal time by a festal order, by which he would even wish to be set free. He is slain by the sword, and his head is brought on a platter. This dish was well suited to their cruelty, in order that their insatiate savageness might be feasted. Look, most savage king, at the sights worthy of thy feast. Stretch forth thy right hand, that nothing be wanting to thy cruelty, that streams of holy blood may pour down between thy fingers. And since the hunger for such an herd of cruelty could not be satisfied by banquets, nor the thirst by goblets, drink the blood pouring from the still flowing veins of the cut-off head. Behold those eyes, even in death, the witnesses of thy crime, turning away from the sight of the delicacies. The eyes are closing, not so much owing to death, as to horror of luxury. That bloodless golden mouth, whose sentence thou couldst not endure, is silent, and yet thou fearest. Yet the tongue, which even after death is wont to observe its duty as when living, condemned, though with trembling motion, the incest. This head is born to Herodias. She rejoices. She exults as though she had escaped from the crime, because she has slain her judge. What say you, holy women? Do you see what you ought to teach, and ought also to unteach your daughters? She dances, but she is the daughter of an adulteress. But she who is modest, she who is chaste, let her teach her daughter religion, not dancing. And do you, grave and prudent men, learn to avoid the banquets of hateful men? If such are the banquets, what will be the judgment of the impious? End of chapter 6 Book the Third Seven of Concerning Virgins Book the Third This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Concerning Virgins by St. Ambrose Book the Third Chapter 7 In reply to Marcelina, who had asked what should be thought of these, who, to escape violence, killed themselves, St. Ambrose replies by narrating the history of Pelagia, a virgin, with her mother and sister, and goes on to speak of the martyrdom of the blessed Soteris, one of their own ancestors. As I am drawing near the close of my address, you make a good suggestion, holy sister, that I should teach upon what we ought to think of the merits of those who have cast themselves down from a height or have drowned themselves in a river, lest they should fall into the hands of persecutors, seeing that Holy Scripture forbids a Christian to lay hands on himself. And indeed, as regards virgins placed in the necessity of preserving their purity, we have a plain answer, seeing that there exists an instance of martyrdom. St. Pelagia lived formerly at Antioch. Being about fifteen years old, a sister of virgins and a virgin herself, she shut herself up at home at the first sound of persecution, seeing herself surrounded by those who would rob her of her faith and purity, in the absence of her mother and sisters, without any defence, but all the more filled with God. What are we to do, unless says she to herself, Thou, a captive of virginity, takest thought, in both wish and fear to die, for I meet not death but seek it. Let us die, if we are allowed, or if they will not allow it, still let us die. God is not offended by a remedy against evil, and faith permits the act. In truth, if we think of the real meaning of the word, how can what is voluntary be violence? It is rather violence to wish to die and not to be able, and we do not fear any difficulty. For who is there who wishes to die and is not able to do so, when there are so many easy ways to death? For I can now rush upon the sacrilegious altars and overthrow them, and quench with my blood the kindled fires. 
I am not afraid that my right hand may fail to deliver the blow, or that my breast may shrink from the pain. I shall leave no sin to my flesh. I fear not that a sword will be wanting. I can die by my own weapons. I can die without the help of an executioner in my mother's bosom. She is said to have adorned her head and to have put on a bridal dress, so that one would say that she was going to a bridegroom, not to death. But when the hateful persecutors saw that they had lost the prey of her chastity, they began to seek her mother and sisters. But they, by a spiritual flight, already held the field of chastity when, as on the one side persecutors suddenly threatened them, and on the other, escape was shut off by an impetuous river. They said, What do we fear? See the water. What hinders us from being baptized? And this is the baptism whereby sins are forgiven, and kingdoms are sought. This is a baptism after which no one sins. Let the water receive us, which is wont to regenerate. Let the water receive us, which makes virgins. Let the water receive us, which opens heaven, protects the weak, hides death, makes martyrs. We pray thee, God, creator of all things, let not the water scatter our bodies, deprived of the breath of life. Let not death separate our obsequies, whose life's affection has always conjoined. But let our constancy be one, our death one, and our burial also be one. Having said these words, and having slightly girded up the bosom of their dress, to veil their modesty without impeding their steps, joining hands as though to lead a dance, they went forward to the middle of the river bed, directing their steps to where the stream was more violent, and the depth more abrupt. No one drew back, no one ceased to go on, no one tried where to place her steps. They were anxious only when they felt the ground, grieved when the water was shallow, and glad when it was deep. One could see the pious mother tightening her grasp, rejoicing in her pledges, afraid of a fall lest even the stream should carry off her daughters from her. These victims, O oh Christ, said she, do I offer as leaders of chastity, guides on my journey, and companions of my sufferings. But who would have cause to wonder that they had such constancy whilst alive, seeing that even when dead they preserved the position of their bodies and moved? The water did not lay bare their corpses, nor did the rapid course of the river roll them along. Moreover, the Holy Mother, though without sensation, still maintained her loving grasp and held the sacred knot which she had tied, and loosed not her hold in death, that she, who had paid her debt to religion, might die, leaving her piety as her heir. For those whom she had joined together with herself for martyrdom, she claimed even to the tomb. But why use instances of people of another race to you, my sister, whom the inspiration of hereditary chastity has taught by descent from a martyred ancestor? For whence have you learned, who had no one from within to learn, living in the country, with no virgin companion, instructed by no teacher? You have played the part, then, not of a disciple, for this cannot be done without teaching, but of an heir of virtue. For how could it come to pass that holy Soteris should not have been the originator of your purpose, who is an ancestor of your race, who, in an age of persecution, born to the heights of suffering by the insults of slaves, gave to the executioner even her face, which is usually free from injury, when the whole body is tortured, and rather beholds than suffers torments, so brave and patient that when she offered her tender cheeks to punishment, the executioner failed in striking before the martyr yielded under the injuries. She moved not her face, she turned not away her countenance, she uttered not a groan or a tear. Lastly, when she had overcome other kinds of punishment, she found the sword which she desired. End of chapter 7 End of book the third of Concerning Virgins by St. Ambrose of Milan